All right, boys, here's the latest scoop. So I've been focusing on the mechanical side of everything. I have the engine completely stripped down, as you can see. Oil cooler, housing's gone, freeze plugs are gone. Side's been all cleaned up. I've had so much oil caked on here, so I've got all that cleaned up. Backside, I've got the rear cam plug that's taken out. The rear main housing is probably gonna stay on just because this, all those gaskets on here aren't that old and this rear main is not leaking. And then on the side of the engine, I do still have the tappets in there and I just had those held in with zip ties going around them. Those are gonna come out once I drop the oil pan and the oil pan's just on there so I'm not having oil drip everywhere while I keep it in the state for a week or so. Going to the front of the engine, pretty simple. You just have one bearing for the cam and that looks great as well. So I'm not gonna be changing that. But when I took apart this engine, I did have one concern and that concern was on the camshaft. To show you what I have going on, you can actually see, like on this lobe, on this side, you see the pitting there. This lobe, it's definitely lighter pitting, but it's all throughout the whole crown. But I also have lobes like this that look even worse. If I run my fingernail over this, none of it's raised up. So I can't imagine that there'd be any raising up of the pitting just because you have a tappet putting a lot of pressure on those things as it's rolling around but none of the bearing surfaces those don't have any pitting so i'm not sure why that happened or what caused it i'm sure there's a lot of people who know a lot more than me this entire project i'm very much an amateur and i'm learning as i go so just wanted to bring that up but that's the one thing i have to tackle before i start assembling everything on there and just going over the the, the cam itself when you take this out, you do have this retainer plate or a thrust plate. And where this goes is right on the back side of this gear. Have that slot and it fits right in there, just bolts up right to the block. And when you take this off, you should feel for wear. All I'm doing is taking my fingernail to it and I feel absolutely nothing there. So this plate is in excellent condition. And this is just gonna go right back in. I've seen some people where if you're taking this off and this is the only piece that, that has wear on it and you don't wanna wait for a new one to come in, some people just flip it on over and run it that way without any issues. So that is one way to do it. Something I wanna go over on this video though is throughout my whole process here, if you're even taking little things off, not if you're getting as far as this on the engine, but there's sometimes little things that just might go completely over your head because you've never done it. You're not sure where to go from there. Um, and I just wanna bring up a few things. So one of them is right where that rectangular hole is and that's where the oil filter housing goes. To kind of make sense of this whole component here, on the back side of this housing, you do have your oil cooler. Oil's going in one of these two holes. On the back side here, this is having coolant flow right through it. All this is is a big, big heat exchanger. So the coolant temperature is regulating that oil temperature. And then on the filter housing itself, I'm sure you've seen this nut or cap here. On the back side of it, you're gonna have a plunger and a spring in here. What that spring looks like is right here. So it is fairly large, it's not small. This is the part number for it. And this is for the 12 valve, so the earlier engines. And if that spring is worn out, you're not gonna get as high oil pressure as you should be having. So if you have the housing at this state, if you're doing a new oil cooler or you're doing anything else, change that out it's going to be worth it the second thing is going to be this right here and this is a relief valve what that looks like is right here so that's it here's the back side of what you're looking at in that housing and this part number is the same for 12 and 24 valve that's right there and what that does is if that filter gets clogged and it's not flowing enough it's actually going to bypass that filter and flow the oil right out of here so if that spring gets weak it's also gonna be bypassing that filter a little bit. So you wanna make sure both these springs are in good condition. They're not very expensive, so if you're already in there, replace those two things. The other thing, and I'll go back to it, I did mention it briefly, but on the back side of this engine, you have a plug here that goes on the back side of that cam. So the cam's right on the other side of this plug. But if you're doing a rear main, if you're doing a transmission swap, and you're already back here, this is right behind the adapter plate, Check it out, make sure it's not weeping because when I did my transmission, I didn't check that, I didn't even know to check that. And if that's leaking, you're gonna get all kinds of oil buildup on the backside of this engine, it's always gonna leak. 
So it bothered me a lot. And the way this plug works is in this groove, an O-ring goes right in there. And then this cam plug goes right in there. This is a used one, so it's not gonna fit. But when the cam plate or the cam plug goes in there, you just hit the center of it with a hammer and it distorts it and pushes it out. And that's how it seals that off. So just check it. This thing's like $7, it's not very much money. Uh, but worth to pay attention to. As far as the P-Pump goes, I'm not changing anything there. It's already had 4Ks in it. It's got towing delivery valves. I don't want to change anything in there. The only thing that I'm replacing on it is this seal, and this is just the one that goes into the gear housing. That's it. It's been working fine. Not going to touch anything. Uh, going to gasket surfaces... This took me so long and I had no idea this even existed, but I'm sure anyone watching this video probably does your own gaskets. You've probably done a head gasket here and there and you've taken that razor blade and you spent your time and you made sure everything was clean on this deck surface. But to take it a step further, buy these carbide scrapers. Even after you've made that thing immaculate with, with that razor blade, if you use this, you're gonna take off so much more crud than you even knew that was there. So this will give you a much better mating surface. I bought these on Amazon, this two pack for 40 bucks. But if you're not used to using those and you do your own gaskets, buy the carbide scraper. It's gonna just take everything to a much cleaner level and make sure that everything's gonna be sealing off correctly. So that's the big thing on my engine. That's everything that I'm working on here. In the next week, I am gonna be looking at if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna find a machine shop to regrind that cam if I'm just gonna find a used OEM cam. I could go aftermarket, but I'm not gonna go that route just because most aftermarket cams, they put that power band in the middle or upper third of the spectrum. And I'm not building this for that. I want that low end grunt. This is a daily driver crawler. So an OEM cam is perfect for my situation. I don't need anything fancy, but that's what I'll be working on there. The last thing I wanna show you in this video is the transfer case itself. So my truck, it did come with the MP241 transfer case, and this is going right back in here for this build. I'm going to clean this all up. I'm going to pull it apart. I'm going to check the bearings. I'm going to check the seals, and I'm going to check the sprint or the uh, chain to make sure it's not stretched too much because those things can stretch over time, and that goes with any chain-driven case. But one thing that I want to just future-proof for <clears throat> is I will be going to a 205 doubler in the future. Not right after this is done. It's going to be probably years down the line because I'm overworking on everything. But I am going to go to a 205 doubler, and I've already measured it out. When you mount this up to the back of the transfer case, the 205 doubler flange is going to be very, very close to how the 241 sits. So I can get away with running one drive shaft. I'll build it once, and then when I do that swap, my drive shaft is still going to work correctly. Now, going to that front axle, the flange yoke I have coming off that pinion is going to be for a Rockwell size U joint. And when I go to a 205 doubler, it's gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be a Rockwell size U-joint. So I am switching out this flange and to show you what I'm doing here. So this is the factory flange that came on the Dodge trucks. This is the Dodge drive shaft bolt pattern. And then what I'm switching it out for is gonna be this right here. And this is going to a Rockwell size pattern to kind of show you the difference when I lay them on top of each other and try to center it up as best as possible. It's not a whole heck of a lot bigger, but it is definitely bigger, especially where these bolts are for what hold the drive shaft in place. And if you want to do the same thing to show you what I've done here, I bought this flange from Northwest Fab, and this is for a 205. So the 205 shaft is a 1 and 3 eighths diameter. The 241 is also a 1 and 3 eighths diameter. So it fits perfectly. It's the same exact size. The important measurement from where that nut sits right on the inside of this shelf to the back of this is what's pressing against the bearing. That is also the exact same between these two. So there's two dimensions of what you do have to switch. And you can see where this is machined on the Dodge. I had the machinist machine this down to the same thing. And this scraper plate, wear sleeve, this is from this flange. So I just took it off and then swapped it over. So I had him copy that dimension. So that does have to change the work in the seals that come on that transfer case. And then I also took a quarter inch off the diameter here. I had to do that to clear this shifter arm, but this is all the way in the forward position. So it's not gonna go more forward than that. And if I get that on there, 
So with the quarter inch taken off, you can see the clearance. So it's perfect. That's probably maybe three sixteenths of an inch between there. So I do have plenty of clearance. And then when you do go to, so this is a Rockwell U-joint. When that's on there, it's not any bigger. If I can get that on. So that's how it looks, but it spaces it farther, of course, so you have even more room. Even if this yoke was bigger, it's going to be fine. So if you want to do the same thing, this will put a Rockwell end on the front output of your T-case. So I'm doing that again because later down the line, I'm going to a 205 doubler, and this way I can do one drive shaft. It's going to be Rockwell on both ends of the axle and the T-case. But that's it. Those are my updates. The next video is going to actually show, show things together. I'll probably have that all cleaned up and that is it.